Hi, I'm Suze Moore and welcome back. Today we're going to join Nat Walker again in Crimson Poison, the first book in my Nat Walker adventure series. And I thought it would be fun if Tigger the wolf joined us as well for the reading because Nat is stuck in Mongolia and she's just completely blacked out as her wolf Jebe has been shot down. We join Nat on chapter 61, Biological Weapon. The CQN reporter and cameraman were led into an empty parade ground for their exclusive interview with the general. An icy Siberian wind was gusting across, bearing snow. Blocks of grey buildings with bars over the windows lined each side of the ground and a red carpeted podium with a tented roof stood at the centre. You can film from here, said the general, greeting them at the steps. They assembled their equipment and ran a test. Ready, said the general, puffing on a cigar. The reporter nodded and started the interview. The camera focused in on the general's puffy face. While they spoke, a line of uniformed soldiers came marching into the parade ground, a tank rumbling in behind them. The reporter raised her voice to be heard over the din. Watch, ordered the general, cutting in on the reporter. The camera followed his arm as he waved towards the far corner of the parade ground. Suddenly, a dark shadow came rocketing around the corner, heading like a missile at the soldiers. What the? said the reporter, her jaw dropping. Is that a man? The man reached the first soldier and high kicked him straight across the parade ground. He then chased him like the wind and caught him midair before tossing him at the podium. The soldier came crashing down on the red carpet, narrowly missing the camera. The man turned and charged at the remaining soldiers, engaging them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was a whirlwind of kicks, punches and throws. Screams of agony rang across the yard and within seconds he had taken out every one of his opponents, casting them to all four corners of the parade ground. The reporter was lost for words. She stood rooted to the spot, the microphone frozen in her hand. The man let out a fierce roar and ran at the tank. He flipped the tank on its roof and continued to flip it along the ground like a rolling stone. Enough, ordered the general. The man stopped, turned and saluted the general. The cameraman caught the image that would go world worldwide in a viral explosion. A super soldier wearing black ops gear and a balaclava stamped with the berserker's heraldic emblem. It, it, it is that, said the reporter, her voice shaky. Berserker's, berserker's new weapon? How is this possible, General? The General smiled. It is in the Berserkan blood. We have it in our blood. Chapter 62 Mrs. McTavish It was late when Mrs. McTavish finally gave Henry leave to go to his bedroom. Hi! I was about to give up on you, said Wen, picking up his call. Have you seen that crazy berserk and general and his bionic soldier on the news? Henry shook his head. Well, wow, Sai, scary stuff. Everyone's saying it's a hoax, but imagine if it's not. Dad says we'll have berserk and super soldiers invading China before we know it. I couldn't get away from the horrible new nanny mummies hired. Wen snorted. A nanny? You're not a baby. I've had to follow her rules ever since she got here this morning. Cold shower, 
one hour extra maths homework, one hour learning the future perfect in Latin. And she made me finish a whole bowl of lumpy salt porridge before I could get down from the table. And she smells of rotten eggs and she's going to be Nat's nanny too. Never, said Wen. And we went to the new house today. Mummy showed us the new wing they're designing. It's like a prison. They're going to put Nat in there with Mrs McTavish and now Mrs McTavish is saying she'll do a better job of controlling me if I'm there as well. Well, we're going to have to put a stop to them, aren't we? said Wen. But we can't unless we get Nat back in time. Wen smiled. Don't worry, there's still a few days left before it goes to court. If that doesn't work out, I'll hire one of those berserkin super soldiers to come and sort your nanny out. Henry's shoulders slumped. He tried to fight back the tears, but they came anyway. I hate my family. They're all horrid. Prissy just ignores me. Daddy is out at his new club the whole time and Mummy is busy with her new life. I wish I didn't exist. Don't say that, said Wen, leaning into camera. We need you, Henry. Nat needs you and she's part of your family. So you better shape up, ding-a-ling, and we can put together a plan for when she returns. Chapter 63, North. Smoke caught at the back of Nat's throat, making her cough. She tried to move her head, but daggers of pain shot up through her skull. Her eyes flickered open. She was lying on a grubby felt pad next to a stove. Smoke was curling up and out of its loose fitting door, filling the girl with a grey haze. On the other side of the tent, she spotted the short squat man from the waterfall. He was seated at a table, bent over a microscope. Nat tried to move, but found her hands were tied together behind her back and her feet were bound by rope. She wondered how long she'd been there. Her mouth was dry, her throat parched. Water, she croaked. The man looked up, his eyes widened in fright. He wore a black patch over one eye and a deep scar ran from his forehead to his neck. Quiet, he barked in thickly accented English. Please, I'm thirsty. He grunted, got to his feet, grabbed a jug from another table and poured its contents into a filthy cup. He limped over and held it roughly to her lips. Drink. Nat took a sip. She spat it out on the mat. Her throat was on fire. The man laughed and returned to his table. Tears welled up. She bit her lip. Please, let me go. Ha, he said. You rich Hong Kong girl. Now you make me rich. How could he know about her? Unless... You are clan? He banged his fist on the table. Do not speak to me of clan. Nat squeezed her eyes shut, wishing the nightmare to end. The man was muttering to himself now. Nat hadn't a clue what he was saying until... Buka, she said, hearing him shout the big angry man's name. What? he roared, spinning around. She shrank back, curling herself into a ball as he jumped off his chair and came barreling across the tent. Buka, he said, leaning in, jabbing his finger at his eye patch. I tell you, Buka, look. He lifted the patch. She averted her gaze, starting to sob. My father is Buka. He did this, bad man. Look he screamed. She turned towards him. His stale breath hung in the air between them. Underneath the patch lay a shriveled, sunken, eyeless socket. He dropped the patch back in place. 
I'm sorry, she whispered. Her words seemed to calm him. He grunted and stood up. We hunted his arrow, bam, he said, putting his hand over the patch. I I'm very sorry. He spat on the mat. Buka, he spat again. Is that why you're poisoning the clan, said Nat. He looked at her, cocking his head to one side. Bad people. Why? Father bad, I fight him. Clan and Mother Gan threw me out. I walk three weeks to Bar Zerka. Please don't kill anyone. Please, she said. He shrugged. They must be punished and strode back to the table where he reached underneath and grabbed a bottle and took a long drink. Nat felt the bile rise in her stomach. She was way, way out of her depth, but she had to try. I am Nat. What is your name? He wiped his lips on his sleeve. My name, Borilgi. Borilgi, please, I'm only. The door opened. A tall soldier stepped inside, accompanied by another shorter one, both carrying several bushy plants with huge red flowers. Nat's eyes grew wide. Massive two men vachir plants. The soldiers dumped them on the ground and barked orders at Borilgi. He shouted back at them. Moments later, they left without even glancing at her. Nat tried to move her hands, but they were bound too tightly. Her head felt as if someone was banging it with a hammer. Barilgi bent over his table again. He held a test tube full of fizzing purple froth up to the light. Please, please let me go, she tried again. He put the tube down got to his feet and strode over, flashing a knife in her face. One more word, I cut off your ear, he hissed. Chapter 64, Pursuit. Altan slowed to a trot and checked his watch. He smiled. His timing was good. Jamuka and Princess would be about ready for them all to head off on their planned search for two men vachir plants in the north. He was reaching into his saddlebag for his flask of salty tea when three long howls echoed across the valley. His heart quickened. The howls came again. He listened carefully, pinpointing their direction before throwing back his head and answering with two short yelps. He urged his horse into a gallop. It stretched its neck out, accelerating through the trees. The early morning air bit into his cheeks. Branches flashed past as he ducked and dodged. Maybe Prim Nat had had another asthma attack. He finally came out of the forest to find a stream across his path. He reined his horse to a stop. The water was dirty and a foul stench hit his nostrils. Over here! He shaded his eyes against the sun bouncing off the water and looked upstream to find Jamuka crouching over something on the ground. Altan dismounted and ran over to his uncle. Jamuka was quickly binding Jebe's leg with a torn piece of coat. Patches of bright red blood dripped onto the snow beneath, and Jebe's golden eyes were pained. Bad, said Altan. Shot, said Jamuka. Nat? Jamuka got to his face, got to his feet. His face was ashen. It looks like she's been taken. Altan swallowed hard. Taken, he said, the words sticking in his throat. Jamuka pointed to deep tracks in the snow, leading off up north. He walked over to his horse and jumped up into the saddle. We'll need backup. Get Tabin and Tamur, then follow my tracks. Gosh, it's getting a bit cold out here, it might rain. But... 
one more. Here we go. Oh, the wind really is up. I think I, I'm going to have to take this inside. Oh, the rain's coming. Phew. Very nice to be back inside. It really is very windy and raining out there. So, where had we got to? Chapter 65, The Wing. It took another jug of Irag for Brilgi to fall asleep at the table. Nat waited, listening until his snores reached a constant rhythm. This could well be her only chance. Through the open chimney in the roof, she could see the pale light of dawn. Fizz, she whispered. A faint whirring sound came from inside her pocket and his small snout popped up. Open wings, she said. Low energy. He sounded faint. Please. His eyes blinked. His wings emerged slowly from the pocket. She rolled over, letting him fall out onto the mat. Rolling back the other way, she was able to grab a wing in her hand. She began to rub the sharp edge of it against the rope. Stop, fizz break, he protested, trying to retract the wing away from her, but Nat had it wedged. Sorry. She said close to tears, okay to break. The wing began making progress and the rope started to fray. Her hands were tired, but she kept going. She was halfway through when the wing snapped off and Fizz's body fell to the mat and shut down. Nat gritted her teeth and carried on sawing with his broken wing. Just as the rope broke free, she felt her breath shorten and her chest tighten. Don't panic. She began to count her breaths in and out as she set about trying to loosen the rope around her feet. Suddenly, the door of the gur opened. Quick as a flash, she lay back down. The tall soldier walked in and over to Borilgi. He picked up the empty jug next to him, sniffed it, kicked him and strode out, slamming the door behind him. Barilgi didn't move. He was out cold. Nat sat up. This time she managed to undo the knots, but already the room was starting to swim. And her Ma Huang Ti was with her horse. She couldn't die here. Altan's face came back to her. He had shown her how to take short breaths during her attack in the forest. She tried to take in tiny wisps of air, but the thick smoky air made her choke. She had to do something. She started crawling across the gur. Black spots danced in front of her eyes and her lungs felt as if they were going to burst. With one last breath, she dragged herself up, shakily gripping the table, and reached for the test tubes. What the? growled Barilgi, his good eyes snapping open. His hand shot out, but Nat had already grabbed the test tube of dark purple liquid, put it to her lips, and swallowed. No! he roared punching her back onto the mat. A jolt of electricity surged through Nat's body. Her airways opened up, her lungs became bellows and her eyes popped wide. Her muscles twitched and trembled and in an instant she was on her feet. Barilgi lunged at her but she spun around catching his shoulder with a high kick. Ah! he shouted reeling backwards. Seeing her opportunity, she ran for the door, but he sprang in front of her. She dodged left towards the table. Leaping up into the air, she brought her knees to her chest and somersaulted high over Barilgi's head, coming to land at the door. She pushed it open and bolted out into the snow, surprising a couple of soldiers who were drinking vodka from shot glasses. They laughed when they saw her and formed a human wall blocking the only exit. 
between the tents. Nat ran headlong at them. She jumped up off the ground, propelling both legs forward. Crack! She hit them squarely in the middle of their foreheads with her feet so fast that they didn't have time to react. She tumbled over the top of them, bounced up off the ground and took off running like the wind. She emerged into a compound surrounded by high wire fencing. A row of polytunnel greenhouses lined one side and a snow white field was on the other side. Unsure of where to go, and with a new set of guards hot on her heels, Nat started to run downhill towards the far end of the compound. A bullet whistled past her ear. She willed herself to go faster. A volley of shouts echoed across the compound and the gunfire stopped. She became aware of someone closing in behind her. Glancing over her shoulder, she saw that it was Barilgi. She was nearly at the fence and with another surge of energy, she leapt up, flying through the air towards its chain links. Her hands gripped onto them like a monkey. Suddenly the fence shook with a terrible force. Someone grabbed her ankle and her hands were torn away and she fell. Chapter 66, Fight. Barilgi put his knee on Nat's chest and clamped his hands around her neck. Die, he said, tightening his grip. But a black shadow came flying through the air, knocking Barilgi off his feet. A huge wolf clamped his, its jaws firmly around the back of his neck. Jebe, Nat cried. But Barilgi wrenched the wolf off him. Jebe howled in pain, landing with a thud in the snow. And once again, Barilgi lunged at Nat. But this time she was ready. She popped a one inch punch at his head and the force knocked him sideways to the ground. Catch, princess, came a shout. Nat looked up to see Altan throwing her end of a metal mesh net throwing her the end of a metal mesh net. She caught the edge and as Barilgi staggered back to his feet, they threw the net over him, trapping him like a bear. He tried to fight it off, but Nat ran lightning fast circles around him, winding the net ever tighter until he was completely caught. His arms pinned to his sides. Altan pushed him over onto the ground and padlocked the net together. Nat threw her arms around Altan in relief. Easy, princess, he said, almost crushed by her strength. She let go. Ooh, sorry. Jebe pushed his nose under her hand. I thought you were dead, she said, rubbing his chest. A loud explosion boomed out from the other end of the compound. She turned to see that the greenhouses were alight. Smoke and shouting filled the air. The others, she said, looking at Altan before sprinting up the field with Jebe at her side. She reached the Gur tents to find four soldiers tied together in the centre of the camp. Tabin was standing over them, his coat streaked with blood. A cry came from one of the tents. Nat rushed inside to find Tamar and Jamuka engaged in a fierce kung fu fighting with three soldiers who were in their underwear. Mattresses and sleeping bags were strewn across the floor. Without hesitation, Nat leapt into the air and flew across the girl at one of the soldiers. Her boot met with his shoulder. Crack! Aye! he cried. Immediately, Jebe leapt on top of him and pinned him to the ground. The soldier who was fighting Tamur spun round and his leg flew out to kick at Nat but she saw it coming, reached out, grabbed it and twisted. S hard. Snap. Ugh. The soldier cried, slumping to the ground. Nat chopped him at the neck. 
and he passed out. Jamuka whirled round, lifting his leg high, but the last soldier was clearly a black belt. He deflected the move and came at Jamuka with a right chop. Nat predicted the move before it happened. Just as he was going to hit Jamuka's cheek, she leapt forward, bringing her hand into a tiger claw and grabbing the soldier, soldier's shoulder. Pop! She dislocated it. Ugh! He screamed. Jamuka punched him in the stomach and he collapsed to the ground. Quick, tie them up, he said, tossing her a coil of rope. Fizzing with energy, Nat grabbed the rope and coiled it in one whip of her hand and before the others could help, she wound it around all the soldiers. Jamuka hugged her tight, then said, you must run as fast as you can to Altan Baobao. You don't have much time. Be swift. Go like the wind. Go! She turned and ran outside and Jebe followed. They bounded back to where Altan was waiting with Barilgi. She threw Barilgi over her shoulder like a sack of potatoes. You crazy strong, princess, said Altan. Not for long. It's about to wear off and then you'll have to carry us both. Altan took her hand, leading her to a hole that had been cut in the fence. She tossed Barilgi over it, over the fence, and caught him on the other side. Down, said Altan, pointing through the forest. She took off at a sprint with Jebe at her side. A familiar whinny up ahead spurred her on. She reached her horse and threw Barilgi across the saddle. Take him! she shouted back to Altan. And you, he said, catching up with her breathless. I have to run, she said, her heart beating so fast and the blood pumping through her veins. Follow Jebe, he said. Nat followed the black wolf at top speed. She'd never felt so alert, so alive. Jebe slowed to a lope at the bottom of the valley. Nat could now hear the unmistakable sound of Fred's warble. They came to a small clearing where Fred sat astride her cart horse, holding a large test tube in her gloved hand. You're alive, sang Fred at the top of her voice. She jumped down from the saddle and gave Nat a big slap on the back. Have they retrieved the two-man virtue yet? I'm here on standby, following orders. Nat shook her head, and all of a sudden her whole body started to tremble. It was as if someone had pulled the plug, and all her energy drained away. Her knees buckled, and she fell to the ground. Now's not the time for theatre theatrics, said Fred. whispered Nat, her voice now a faint whisper. Jebe whined and started to lick her face. Fred shoved his nose out of the way. Are you poisoned? No, said Altan, thundering up on his horse. He had Nat's in tow carrying a strapped down Borilgi. He jumped down. She takes secret. What are you talking about? said Fred. That's the end of chapter 66. Thank you very much for joining me and Nat and hopefully I'll see you again tomorrow for chapter 67 as we get to very nearly the end of the book. Thank you very much for joining me. Stay well. Bye bye.